Yeah. She only has one daughter. Carla? Yeah. She's got twin daughters. Oh. No, she got a Very good morning to everyone twins. this morning. Good morning. Uh oh. <laughs> Technical difficulties. That's on slide two. Just advances. There. there. Yeah, How's everybody nice. this morning? <laughs> Always fun when you have change. Ter Pastor Terry and Diane are out celebrating their anniversary this week. So uh, they're out in, I think, Des Moines last time I knew, and they're having a great time, having a good weekend, some time off. So that is awesome for them. They get to have some fun, and it's always great to be able to reconnect. So welcome everyone here. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Uh, can't beat this weather. What is today? November what? <laughs> and so we're looks like we're going to have another wonderful day today, and we're uh, very happy that you're here with us today. We've got a lot of visitors, so welcome. Uh, we uh, appreciate you being here today. And for those who are online, welcome as well. If you're watching online, please let us know. Make some comments in there, and uh, let us know you're here with us here this morning as we uh, join together. So let's open up with a word of prayer this morning. Gracious Lord and Heavenly Father, we just praise you and thank you that you've brought us here together freely and openly to hear your word today and to be able to rejoice and celebrate the things you do in our life each and every day. Lord, we just ask today that you would open our ears to hear, our eyes to see, and our hearts to claim that message and live it out each and every day. Uh, Lord, we thank you that... Uh, you have blessed us so richly in this land and in this community, and we just praise you and thank you that we have a safe place to, to live and a safe place here together, here together freely and openly this morning. And we just ask, Lord, that you would bless us today as we go throughout our day and as we come into this Thanksgiving season here this week, we ask that, Lord, we remember all of the blessings that you give us each and every day and all of the things that we can be thankful for so many times we focus on all the negative things, but Lord, let this week be a celebration of thanksgiving for all of the blessings that we do have in our lives. So Lord, we just ask that you would open our hearts for worship this morning. Have, have us receive the message that you have for us to hear today and to live it out each and every day of our lives. In your precious and holy name we pray. Amen. So this Wednesday, uh, we're going to be continuing on through The Chosen, and unfortunately, this is the last episode in season three, and we have to wait all the way until they release season four in March in order to go on through season four in March, but it's absolutely awesome. Um, so this week, we're going to be talking about these two episodes, seven and eight, are on faith and belief, and so it gives us a really good refresher course in, in belief and understanding what that is and how faith can live out in our lives and we can live that faith out as a representation of God in Christ to those who we come into contact with. Um, so in these episodes, uh, we're going to see them as they come through and it kind of focuses on some chaos that's going on. Uh, Jesus had left to go out and pray by himself and he's preparing for what he has to do coming up. And so they go into a town called Decapolis, and Decapolis is a very torn community. It's a trade hub center for that whole area. And so you've got a lot of different sectors in town that are coming together. And the apostles went out and preached the good news in there, and it's really caused an uproar. And uh, so they have a very deeply divided multi-ethnic region in there, and it's amazing to watch. So Wednesday, if you can make it here at 7 o'clock, um, it's amazing because we're going to see the story of the loaves and fish and things like that. And, and, and it's really well done the way they do it. Um, so 7 o'clock Wednesday, be here. And I realize that <coughs> Thursday is going to be Thanksgiving Day. So we want to make sure that we get in and get out quick enough so you can go home and prepare for the day ahead. And then what we'd like you to do starting... December here is we are starting a new Christmas tradition. Beginning on December 1st, we are going to read the book of Luke. Each evening, take one chapter out of the book of Luke. There's 24 chapters, so that by the time we get to Christmas Eve, you've read the entire story of Jesus, and you know why the nativity's here, you know what it's about, and you know what Christmas is about. 
So it's kind of a neat way, so you can read through it. It's a very easy read, one chapter in the evening, and you know who and why we celebrate. And if you have any questions on that, we're going to have uh, links, our tradition bookmarks that you can see right up there. You're going to see that right on our webpage. You can click on that, and it'll tell you exactly what. The neat thing is, Pastor Terry went ahead, and he created this whole chart, so you can go down and make little check marks for yourselves on the chart to make sure you didn't skip a day. So uh, that should be really awesome. I, I think it's an awesome way for us to celebrate the season. Then, coming up next Saturday, our next men's breakfast will be here. So we transform all the chairs out, put tables in place, and we have a men's breakfast in here, and that starts at 9 o'clock a.m., so you're all invited to come to that. And uh, we love to see that. We have a devotion time in here, lots of great discussion. Now we got a whole bunch of car guys in here, so we usually have a bunch of talks about cars and hot rods and things like that. So mm -hmm. it's, it's a good time for us to just kind of get together and gel together. And then uh, usually the devotions, and I've got extra copies of all the devotions that we've had so far on the back table back there. And it's kind of a good thing for men to look at, you know, their roles and responsibilities in the family and in the community and as leaders of the household. So we have different insights into those things. And, and so uh, this next Saturday at 9 o'clock a.m. we'll be doing that. And then we are going to be starting our... Uh, four-week Advent series called Why the Nativity, and this is done by Dr. David Jeremiah. It's absolutely awesome. The film came out last year, but they it went worldwide. They had such a demand, they couldn't print enough of the study guides and everything. So I ordered mine last year when I got the movie, so I got the movie right away. But uh, I got the study guides here in October. <laughs> so we are going to do the Why the Nativity as our study, um, beginning on December 3rd, we're going to start the series in here. December 2nd then, in the afternoon, we send out a questionnaire to see which time everybody would like to be here. But there's an hour and a half movie that goes along, and it's very, very well done. Uh, this is actually a scene from it, uh, so it's, it's, it's a very well done production out there. Uh, so we're going to show that hour and a half that kind of gives you the basis for the um, the series that we're going to be doing on the Nativity or the Advent season. And then if you'd like to, we'll have a link onto our website. So if you can't be here that Saturday or uh, you need to have a refresher as we're going through the series, then you can go back and play the movie again there. Um, and that'll be at Grace Street Church, Why the Nativity? And then the links will be in there. Then we're going to be going Christmas caroling on December 9th and uh, so we do that we go to a couple of care centers and we go to some uh, people who are shut-ins and we do some just short caroling times for them uh, it's really well the, the people in the care centers just absolutely love it uh, a lot of times there's nobody that has family in the care centers and so um, we just went through that whole series of my dad being in the care center and everything and I was talking to one gentleman there, and his family hasn't visited him since they put him in there two and a half years ago. So sometimes this is the kind of the outside stimulus, some of the things that you know the people really crave and they really want. So it's a, it's a really heartwarming thing to hear it. Whether we're on key or not, doesn't make a difference. They just love that fellowship time. Um, and then, after we get done with all that, uh, we're gonna be having our, um, we're going to be having our candlelight service. We're trying to figure out, because of the holiday and the time that's hitting in here, what kind of service we're going to do for Christmas uh, here. And so we're going to have that. We'll have hopefully that posted up for you guys uh, by next week. And then starting in January, starting off January, very, very uh, good terms here. We're going to start a new year, fresh start to the year. So we're going to be showing the movie A Bridge to Terabithia. And that's a movie about a couple of preteens that were going through some rough situations, bad uh, family life in their homes, uh, some abuse that was going on in there, and then bullying at school and these kind of things. And so you have these two unlikely characters, the new girl that comes to the school trying to find her way, 
and the kid who is the track star of the school, and she wins the foot race, and he's lost immediately. But it's really weird. They, they came out. They kind of didn't like each other whatsoever. It wasn't a good fit, and they ended up being best friends. And uh, it's an absolutely awesome movie. Um, we showed this uh, several years back and had some study time with it. And it really, really went over well. And it's a very meaningful movie and very, very well done. And we will have plenty of tissues in the back there. It gets a little teary at the end uh, due to some things that happen. And I'm not going to spoil it. So, uh, no spoiler alerts here today. So I won't, I won't go into that, but it's a very, very well done movie. And it's actually based on real world, actual events, true story. Okay, and then uh, at the end of the service here, Doug, our master technician back there today, he's gonna be putting up a link to our music that we have in here, and we curate the music each week to try and fit in with the message, and hopefully it gives you a very, very good um, feeling in there, a message in the music as well. So that's our announcements for this morning here, so uh, we'll go ahead and, and start into our uh, time of worship here. So our call to worship that I chose this morning comes from Ephesians 4, 11 through 16. And uh, this, it talks about the gifts that were given to the church of the day, to us today. Now these are the gifts that Christ gave to the church. He gave the apostles and prophets and the evangelists and pastors and teachers. Their responsibility is to equip God's people to do his work and to build up the church, which is the body of Christ. Now, a lot of people think that when you talk about a church, it's a building. But the church has nothing to do with the building. It is the body of Christ. It is the, the believers that are in the church itself. And this will continue as we all come to such unity in our faith and knowledge of God's Son that we will be mature in the Lord. So what he's doing, he's giving us a process to bring us back into a right relationship. That's what the term righteousness means. It's a right relationship to have with God. And so as we mature in our faith, we have God has sent us all these people to come out and to preach and to teach and to advocate for you. And we'll go into the advocate later on. Um, so it, until it measures up to the full and complete standard of Christ that he set for us. Then we will no longer be immature like children. We won't be tossed and blown about by every wind of new teaching. We will not be influenced when people try and trick us into lies so clever they sound like the truth. And instead we will speak the truth in love, growing in every way more and more like Christ who is the head of the body of the church. He makes the whole body fit together perfectly. As each part does its own special work, it helps the other parts grow so that the whole body is healthy and growing and full of love. And see, that's our responsibility. We talk about that a lot in here about edifying each other, lifting each other up when we're in a bad situation, when we have health issues, when we have something that's going on in our lives. The body of Christ is here to surround you out of love, grace, and mercy to lift you up out of that situation. I love to call it a hand up out of your situation. People take handouts for granted, and they don't have meaning. But a hand up actually says, hey, I am invested in you, and I want to make sure that you're doing you know, the best that you can. Because as the body of Christ, that's what we're called to do. So God's gift to the church are persons who have been gifted to preach and teach God's people and you know some of us are ordained to do that and ordained doesn't mean that you just had to go through all the school and which I did but you don't have to go to the school and go through all that stuff and get a piece of paper that says you're ordained it means that you are ordained by God God has put it on your heart and he has equipped you to go out and help <coughs> other people and a lot of times that's done and people don't understand a lot of times that ordination comes through the trials that you go through in your lives. And so as we go through these trials, it equips us then to go later on in life and help someone else that's going through that exact same thing. That's a part of that equipping, that ordination that God does for us. 
So it doesn't have to be a formal office, and it doesn't mean like back in the Pharisee days and the Sadducee days, where you're ordained to lord over the people, you know, and say, I am a high priest. It has nothing to do with that. It means that we're here to edify each other and to lift, lift each other up with the gifts that God has blessed you with. And we all have different gifts. See, God is, is concerned about ordering the church, but not about an order of ministry, so to speak. There, he doesn't really care about a hierarchy. He just wants to make sure that we're all part of that body of Christ, that we're all welcomed in. So these persons have been given the ability to fulfill a variety of duties that enable the church, the body of Christ, to be and do what God intended us to be and to do. So a lot of people look at the Bible and they're going, oh man, this Old Testament stuff, it's crazy. But see, that Old Testament is ordered by God. It was written in an order. So if you look at it, the Pentateuch, which is the first five books of the Bible in the Old Testament, they're how, who God is. First, it's an introduction to who God is. It's an introduction to what God has done for the people, all the people as a whole. It tells you who you are in the kingdom of God. And then it, it goes on and tells you how to live a godly life, how to be a part of the body of Christ, the church. This is what the first five books are all about. That's what the Pentateuch is. So you have all of the laws that were established by Moses back in the day in and under the old covenant that God established with Abraham back in the day. And so that whole Old Testament, the first five books, are all how to be God's people. And this is exactly what we're talking about in here. And then we go from there into the journey, the exodus, and we're going on through all of the different things that happened to God's people and what God did for them as they turned away. You know, And so you have the books of the judges and the kings, and he brought people, he brought rulers into the rule to try and bring the people back to God to form that right relationship. And then, failing all that because people are fallible, we're all fallible, we're never perfect. So what God did is that he, he set in his son Jesus then, he set up the second covenant. And the second covenant then is the New Testament. So the old is gone, and we're like a new creation in the New Testament. And so there's a new covenant with new rules and laws. The Sermon on the Mount is that set of rules and laws. And it tells who Jesus is. And it tells why he's here. And it tells us how to be a covenant people with God again. What he's doing is he is reestablishing re that relationship with God, which is what he's wanted all along, since we were very created. So together with all of this then, they function to guide the church in faith and in knowledge and truth to preserve it from being swept away by error or division. And we saw back in the days where the people were rebelling against God, and so what did he do? He scattered the 12 tribes of Israel until he finally brings them back together under the new covenant. So there's a lot of neat things in there. And I know as a kid, I was reading this, and I go, I don't know about all this moldy Babylonian stuff. It makes no sense to me. But it's until I was revealed by God and establishing my relationship with God, then he reveals all of these mysteries to us. And then it all of a sudden it's like the light switch is turned on and it all makes sense. So what he does is he sends people like Terry and I here to help kind of guide you along in the process. So that's what we are. These leaders are not given to the church to do everything. We're not meant to do everything. The church member would simply then just become a consumer of the leader's spiritual gifts. Leaders are given to the church to equip members so that they all might do the work of ministry together and so build the body of Christ in doing so. So we're here to shepherd and, and help along in the process in here, but it's really to develop an individual relationship with God in the process. That's what this is all about. All Christians do not have the same calling or function or gifts or talents that God gives us. He creates us to be uniquely, uniquely individual, which means I shouldn't want to go out and, 
and do the same thing that Bill does because Bill's got a different calling. He's got a different set of gifts than what God gave me or Steve or Denise or Denny. We're all created uniquely by God and given a purpose. God has a plan for each one of us, has ordained us with that purpose to fulfill in our lives. And so I can't live Bill's life or Steve's life. I can't live AJ's life because God gave me my life to live and he has a plan for my life. He's got a plan for AJ's life. He's got a plan for Monica's life. Everybody has a plan in God's book, in his ministry. The person who performs the duty listed in office functions are like equippers who prepare the rest of the members for their work in Christ. All Christians are called to use their own gifts in ministry. So each one of us has these gifts. And as we grow in our relationship, then God enables us with more gifts. Those are called spiritual gifts. And we'll go into those at a later point in time. So all of these things are called so that we understand that we're just not somebody that's placed on the earth. God has a purpose and a plan for each and every one of us here. And it's up to us to reach out and say, hey, God, I'm here. Tell me what to do next. And that's what he's waiting for. He's waiting for us to call on him and say, hey, I'm ready. Take me to the show. Show me what to do. So as we're winding down season three and we're looking forward to season four, I want to talk about some of the themes that they've had in The Chosen in here. And The Chosen is a wonderful, wonderful tool to equip people to bring them back into that one-on-one -on -one relationship with God. It's to allow the scriptures to kind of come alive. And yes, there's artistic license that's used and backfilled and things like that. And I talked about that a couple of weeks ago. But what it is really, truly, is a way for us to reconnect with God on a more personal level. Because I can stand up and I can quote you every one of the scriptures as we go through and I can read the entire Bible to you but it won't make as much sense to some people as it will to others. And so God provides all these different medias to be able to bring us back into that relationship and to enhance the relationship that we already have. Because no matter who you are, no matter that I have this piece of paper that says I'm ordained and I've been through all the schooling and I've done all the stuff that was required to finish school and have this title, which if you notice I never use, because that's not what it's about. It's about being able to enhance that relationship. So I'm growing in the spirit at the same time as everybody else is. And as I grow my relationship, then God blesses me with answers to the mysteries, as it says in the scripture. So in last week's sermon, I spoke to you about the perceptions and how what we perceive, we tend to believe. And then that belief controls our actions and our actions then define our character. And so I kind of want to talk about that a little bit today and, and talk about what is a Christian belief system, the difference in, and the similarities between belief and faith, because there are differences here. So let us have ears to hear and eyes to see the blessings that God has placed into our lives. This is part of my prayer that I have used many times to awaken us to God's wonders. Let us have ears to hear and eyes to see those blessings. And you heard part of that this morning as we opened our, our worship time in here. And it's kind of a, a reminder to us to, hey, let's pay attention to what God's got going on in our lives. Because trust me, when you really ask for that and you say, hey, open my eyes, my ears, God will reveal those things to you. And he'll show you the things that he's doing in your life. So, this prayer means that we need to have both faith and belief in order for it to mean anything for us whatsoever. So when we have ears to hear and eyes to see, the, that means that we, number one, we believe because we're praying it to God. We believe in God to start with. So I want to talk to you today then about faith and belief. And in the graphic that's up there, hopefully you can see it, but belief is our preferred perceptions that drive our belief system. And so uh, as we go through this, I'll, I'll kind of expound on some of these categories. But beliefs drive our actions and actions define our character. 
So that sounds a lot like what I talked about with perception. But truly, when we perceive something, it's what we visually or audibly hear that will drive our immediate action to whatever's happening to us. So if somebody's swinging a baseball bat at your hat, you, at your head, you think you're gonna get hit with the baseball bat in the head, right? So you perceive that as a threat, and what are you gonna do? You're gonna try and duck, get out of the way, put up a defensive action, whatever it is. It becomes almost instantaneous to us based on what we've experienced in our past. And that's what a perception is. We base our perception upon what we have experienced, what our known issues have been in our lives. Now faith, on the other hand, are beliefs with the addition of trust and loyalty to God. That leads us then to actions and deeds that mimic the character of Christ. And that was what I was talking about in our uh, opening in here in Ephesians. Because that's what it was talking about in there. We, we have this loyalty to God when we believe in God and when we have a loyalty to him, when we put our faith in God, then he will lead us to the actions and deeds that mimic the character of Jesus. And it was really kind of funny because uh, a day or two ago, I posted up a meme on Facebook. And it was from James, and, and it talked about in James that faith, faith without works are dead. And what he means by that is if we just let our faith in, and it was great because I had a guy respond, he goes, no, you know, faith is a gift that was given by God. And I said, yeah, you're absolutely correct. He says, so I shouldn't have to do anything with it. I said, well, Bob, here's the thing. So I want you to look at, at your faith as a Christmas present. We're coming up on the Christmas season. So that faith is a, is a Christmas present from God. Now, when you receive that gift, you're just going to take it and you're going to put it over there in the closet and do absolutely nothing with it, right? You're not going to open it. You're not going to take a look inside it. You're not going to do anything with it. You're going to take that faith, and you're just going to store it away in the closet. No, you're not going to do that. You're going to open up that gift, and you're going to take that gift, and you're going to use it to the measure of fullness and usefulness that God intended it to be in your life. So you're not going to just shove that thing away. Oh, I, I got faith, so I'm, I'm good to go. No, you need to use that faith. You need to put it into action. And by that relationship that we build with God, what it's talking about here in our faith is it leads us to actions and deeds, good works. So what James is talking about there is faith without good works is dead. Without those good deeds that we do, then your faith is just simply laying dormant. And that calls us back to who we are as the body of Christ. We need to be able to lift that faith. We need to take that faith and put it into action to help others out. We're called to serve others. That's one of the main purposes for our lives. We are called to lift up and edify each other. We're called to serve each other. And that's what this gift is all about. That gift of faith, when we put it into action then, is taking God's actions that he had, and those plans that we had for our lives, and we're putting it into and then the more we do that, then it leads to a character. It helps define our character, build our character, to mimic then the character of Jesus, what he did. So when we talk about faith, I want, to, I want you to think about the first thing that comes to your mind. So when I say the word faith, what comes to your mind immediately? You don't have to all shout it out. I just want you to think about that. So I Googled the word just faith. I put it into Google. And it came up with 26,600,000 results. Somebody's been doing a lot of thinking about faith, right? So faith, obviously, is not a dead subject if it's got 26,600,000 hits on it. So that's wow. I mean, wow, just wow. Think about that, 26 million for one word. So Webster defines faith in this way. Belief and trust and loyalty to God. Belief in the traditional doctrines of a religion. Loyalty and complete trust in a concept or deity. And so when we think about faith, 
it's more than just saying, yeah, I know there's a God, but I don't know anything about it. See, it goes past that. That faith says we have to have a loyalty to God, a belief in God, and in the doctrines that he has. So we have to believe, we have to trust in God, and that's what the basis of faith is all about. So, belief is also defined by Webster like this. It's conviction of the truth of some statement or reality of some being or phenomenon, especially when based on the examination of evidence. And that one's kind of a little more abstract when you come into the definition, but see, the difference between faith is you have to have faith in something. It has to be substantial something that that is the basis of your faith. Belief is, well, I'll go into it in a second. The difference between belief and faith is important, and it may be one of the most important concepts out of your life. Because at some point in time, we're going to be faced with judgment, and it's not the time then to be questioning about your beliefs or your faith. I mean, literally, it's not the time. Because when you're up in that judgment seat, everything else is over. All stops are gone. There's no do-overs. There's no timeouts. You can't go back and say, I'm going to change my vote. I'm going to, I'm going to call a lifeline. There's none of that. It's too late for that. So it's best for us to deal with these now and be assured of what we believe, what we put our trust and our faith in when it comes time for that judgment. So let's, be, let's begin with that term belief. So you can see and believe in things that are material in the world. So I could look out the window, and today's not a good example of that because it's an absolutely gorgeous day outside. But see, I could say, I believe it's gonna rain today. And so I would prepare myself accordingly based on that belief. So I might grab a raincoat or an umbrella or a complete rain suit or whatever it happens to be. And the truth of it is, we don't know whether it's gonna rain that day or not. But see, we prepared ourselves based on our perception, which formed a belief that I think it's gonna rain because I'm looking out there and I see in the clouds and yeah, it looks like it might rain. So I'm gonna be prepared and I'm gonna grab an umbrella and I'm gonna go out and meet the day. See, that's what belief is about. You believe something to be and so you prepare yourself accordingly for it based on your perceptions. And your perceptions are those things that you've experienced in your past that have prepared you to make the decision on that belief or act upon it. So that's one example of believing in something to be true and then acting upon that belief. Now in my lifetime, there's been many predictions of things that according to the experts would be coming to pass so that people would prepare themselves as they thought they needed. And here are some of the examples. Well, in my lifetime, I've heard that the end of the world was going to happen in 1983, according to the interpretation of a Mayan calendar. Yep, we're still here, right? Well, that one's false. In 1968, a group of scientists believed we would encounter another Ice Age-style cataclysmic event by the year 1990. Yep, nope. Well, instead, we've got another group of scientific experts that say that we're melting the polar ice caps, everything's going to flood, and that same set of scientists I thought were really fun because they were doing these studies down in Antarctica, and instead what happens was they were using <clears throat> evidence that this whole 100-mile ice flow had melted away, and then they had to be sent in uh, for rescue because the whole thing froze back over four months later and didn't come to pass. So we didn't get taken over. It doesn't mean there's things going on in the world that we just turn a blind eye to. But these people put out these alarming things constantly. And it causes people to act and react accordingly, which is what they believe. If they believe in what these people are saying, then they act and react accordingly. And some of that can be tragic. In 1966, they claimed the world would run out of natural resources by the end of the century. And that didn't happen. It didn't happen. 
and there are those who swear by the quatrains of Michel de Nostradamus, who back in the 1500s wrote down this set of quatrains, and they were kind of poetic predictions of what the future was going to be like. And it got very, very serious, and it's been on TV many, many times. Um, I did a book report on it in college, and he had some of his predictions that lined up with certain events in history, but could never be definitively proven to be actually what he predicted at the time. But see, people reacted to those things, and they, they put their faith and their trust in things like that. And that's what I'm trying to talk about here is they, they tend to take something that is coming from a perceived source of truth. Now here's the thing, the Bible, I love it. I was listening to it today, um, and they were talking about 83% uh, of the prophecies in the Bible have already come true. 83%. So there's 13 prophecies about the end of the world. 10 of those have already come to be. So we only need three more, and every one of those prophecies has come true. Now, out of the 880 prophecies that are in the Bible in there, 83% uh, have already come true. That shows me they've got a pretty good track record. So I would say I could believe what was written in the Bible to be the true and inspired word of God. I could base my belief system upon that and be pretty sure of the fact that I think that's going to be a good, good fit. So when we think of these things, and I bring these up because people believed in things that did not come to pass or were proved to be blatantly false in content, and all of the public decries that went out because of those things, and all the stirs, all the heartaches, all the problems that those false predictions that people put their beliefs in came out to be untrue. Now, some of those stake their very future on those things. Now, if you were like me, just hearing those kind of stats come through, I would want to both face my belief system and base that on things that are true, or at least had an 83% so far track record of being true. So the point I want to make this morning is before we stake our future on something, we need to make sure that the evidence is real and reliable. I mean, that's just common sense, right? What's missing in this world today? Common sense. A lot of, lot of common sense has gone out the window. But before we stake our future, our very future, what we're putting our faith and our trust in, in something, we need to make sure that the evidence is real and reliable. And this is where the truth and evidence come into play that we heard about in that scripture. If the facts cannot stand the test of time, then they should not be used to support your beliefs. Right? And what is that? That's just common sense. So if those facts can't stand the test of time, then they shouldn't be used to support your beliefs, and they shouldn't be a cause for your actions. They shouldn't be a cause for your actions. So now let's move on to faith. We kind of covered belief pretty well. So Matthew 17, 20 through 21 says, For truly I tell you, if you have faith the size of a mustard seed, you will say to this mountain, move from here to there, and it will move. And nothing will be impossible for you. <coughs> now, they use a lot of hyperbole, and they use a lot of metaphors and, and things like that. But what they're trying to say to these people is, you know, a mustard seed is one of the most tiny seeds that you can find. It's about the size of a pencil, the tip of your pencil. And if your faith, if your faith is at least the size of that mustard seed, then you can do immense things in your life. See, because if you have that kind of faith, and if you put that kind of faith and trust in God, remember, that's trust, loyalty to God. That was that definition of God. If we have the faith the size of a mustard seed, then we are going to enable God to do wonderful things in our lives. It doesn't mean that we're going to say, move the mountain and it's going to move. What he's trying to say is, if you put that amount of faith 
It doesn't take an immense measure of faith. And people always say, you know, I can't do that. I'll, I can't go to church because I'll be judged. Or I can't go to church because, you know, these other people, they know a lot more about God than I do. Well, that's why you need to come to church. <laughs> you got to learn it. But what it is, is you're going, I don't have enough faith to do that. How are you ever going to get the faith or the basis for your faith or the basis for your belief system unless you come to start with? Because you're not going to grab this all by osmosis. It doesn't work that way. It won't just simply creep into your being or into your skin. So the scriptures are filled with examples of having faith, 81 verses to be exact, deal with faith alone. Hebrews 11 is a chapter devoted completely to faith. And it starts like this, and it says, Now faith is a substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. It goes against the trust in the unseen, but really, that is what faith is born from. So blind faith is that term that was, con that was coined to uh, describe that faith of being able to having faith in something without being able to see it. And we have a lot of those things in Scripture where uh, Jesus is telling them that great are you who have faith and yet do not see. And we've seen that in the chosen in here because we've seen a lot of those kind of things. So that faith, we need to have that faith without being able to see something. But we can have trust to build that faith on and loyalty to God because of the fact that his word has been ever true. And proven to be true time and time and time again. So it goes against trust in the unseen, but really what faith is born from is blind faith. Blind faith. Being able to have that faith without seeing. And some people out there equate religion with faith. And see, religion and faith are two different things. So it's incorrect to do so. Religion is a construct or a framework to support a belief system. That's all religion is. That's all a denomination is. It's a, frame, a framework or a construct to support that belief system that that particular group has. So as I was doing my research on this, I came across an article from Mark Rathall, who is the BYU professor of theology for the Latter-day Saints Church. <laughs> And Rathall explained that the key issue is the disparity between faith and belief in the world today, that most religious people take everything for granted. Our beliefs are things that we take uh, to be based on truth and our logic and our experiences. If we learn new information, our beliefs can change, but faith, on the other hand, is a different thing entirely. It's commonplace to treat belief and faith as synonyms, but it is important to understand that there is very important differences between them. So Walras said, faith involves a reliance and trust and endures in the face of doubts, whereas belief is simply we just seem to take for true. So we can have faith in things or people without a corresponding belief, and I can believe in things that I don't have faith in, he said. So that's why I can say that I believe the war in Ukraine is inhumane, but I wouldn't say that I have faith that that war in Ukraine is inhumane, if that makes sense. It doesn't mean that faith and belief are mutually exclusive or irreconcilable. So we have to understand that. They're not mutually exclusive. Faith is often accompanied by belief. For instance, one who has faith in God may also hold the belief that God exists, but one can have faith without the corresponding belief, he says. I don't agree with that. I really, really don't. Uh, of course, religious life involves more than faith or belief, essential to pretty much every religion are its practices. And this is where he goes on and makes a really key point, which threw up so many red flags for me when I was reading and writing this, it wasn't funny. The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, for example, has many practices that constitute essential parts of religion. 
from participating in ordinances to attending weekly meetings to ministering to be a Latter-day Saint is a matter of practice rather than belief. That was a direct quote from him. What is a church, a body of Christ, without faith? How can you have this framework and construct and belief in nothing more than practices? And that's why I wanted to start out with that scripture from James that talked about faith and belief and faith without practices is dead. Let's see here. They kind of spun it around and they're, they're all in on the practices. And they missed the point of what they were practicing for, which was God in the first place. To have that right relationship with God. They missed it completely. So in this statement, I feel he describes correctly the definitions of belief and faith, and I agree with those, but where I really differ is in that last part of that statement. I don't believe we can simply go through the motions of religious framework, practices, and be completely devoid of belief and faith. It doesn't work. It cannot work. It would be all for naught, or a fool's errand, if you because you're going to go through all the, all the functions, you're going to go through all the actions, go through all the motions, expend all that time, all that energy for nothing. Because you have no belief and you have no faith by the time it's all said and done. You simply went through the motions. And we see that in some religions today. It's all about the rites, it's all about the rituals. And what they don't teach is they don't teach Jesus Christ. They don't teach salvation. They don't teach why they are here and why they are important to God. They don't teach grace and mercy and love. They miss the point. They go through all the motions. I call them pew warmers or seat warmers, chair warmers. They come in and they occupy the space and they occupy the time, but they have completely devoided themselves of the belief and the faith of why they were there in the first place. And they simply go through the motions and they go, hey, I'm good for another week. I can go out and do whatever I want to do because I've been absolved for a week. But it doesn't work that way. And I always say, have any of you guys ever read the Bible? I mean, seriously, how could you do these things if you haven't read what it says in the Bible? Because it tells you exactly the opposite in the Bible. Exactly the opposite. So, I do think practices, however, I made a note to myself in here. I do think practices are a necessary part of the process of faith. And faith without works is dead, and works without faith is dead. Simply going through the pro process, processes in here, without some kind of faith is dead. What do the scriptures tell us? Works alone will not get you into heaven. And scripture is pretty, pretty clear on that one there. That is black and white. So in my thoughts, in order to have a good relationship with God, it takes belief and faith conjoined from the start. They have to be joined together as that belief, that faith system, that belief system. And then we can grow in the practices as the Holy Spirit leads us. So Hebrews addresses it in this fashion, in Hebrews 3, 1 through 15. And so, dear brothers and sisters who belong to God and are partners with those called to heaven, think carefully about this Jesus, whom we declare to be God's messenger and high priest. <coughs> For he was faithful to God, who appointed him, ordained. Just as Moses <coughs> served faithfully when he was entrusted with God's entire house. But Jesus deserves far more glory than Moses, just as the person who builds a house deserves more praise than the house itself. For every house has a builder, but every but the one who built everything is God. Is God. Moses was certainly faithful in God's house as a servant. His work was an illustration of the truths God would later reveal. But Christ as a son in charge of God's entire house. And we are God's house. We are God's house. 
if we keep our courage and remain confident in our hope in Christ, that is why the Holy Spirit says, today when you hear his voice, don't harden your hearts as Israel did when they rebelled, when they tested me in the wilderness. There your ancestors tested and tried my patience, even though they saw my miracles for 40 years. So I was angry with them, and I said, their hearts have turned away from me. They refuse to do what I tell them. So in my anger, I took an oath. They will never enter my place of rest. Be careful then, brothers and sisters. Make sure your own hearts are not evil and unbelieving, turning you away from the living God. You must warn each other every day while it's still today so that none of you will be deceived by sin and hardened against God. For if we are faithful to the end, trusting in God just as firmly as when we believe, we will share in all things that belongs to Christ. Remember what it says, today when you hear his voice, don't harden your hearts as Israel did when they rebelled. Wow. Kind of spells it all out right then and there. It gives us a format, a framework to follow for our lives, doesn't it? It really does. Jesus doesn't want his followers to live under the burden of regret and shame for making the wrong decisions, for not knowing him. So having faith and believing who he is and who he says he is, then he gives us a promise. John 13, or John 3, 17 says, it, Jesus did not come to condemn the world, but save the world through him. Meaning he didn't come to judge you on your past mistakes. He came so you could repent of those mistakes and be saved. Come into a right relationship with him and be saved from your past. Not that you should live out your past, because what's the next thing he says? He says you must be reborn to the water and the spirit. And when you do, then all of that past stuff is wiped away. You're cleansed from it. And I talked about that last week. So Jesus came so that you could repent of your mistakes and be saved. Salvation. Grace. And it wasn't because of something that we did. He gives us that grace. He gives us that mercy because of his love for us. You can't get to heaven any other way. So in this last episode of, or this episode that we'll see, no, we saw it last Wednesday, sorry. In episode seven, here, if you ever want to go out and watch it online, it's episode seven, season three. We hear Matthew and Mary talking about the experience they've had in their past. Matthew was a tax collector. Mary was a woman of ill repute in the day. Jesus reached out to her and found her in her brokenness and gave her a new life. She was possessed by a demon and he released her. And he gave her a new life. But see, she's still holding on to that past person that she used to be. And Matthew was a Jew, but he was a tax collector. He was collecting taxes from his own people. And of course, the tax collectors took a percentage off the top. And so he was actually taking money from his own people. And Jesus called him out of that life and called him into a different life <coughs> to become a disciple and now an apostle. So Matthew and Mary are talking about the experience that they had in their past. And it was a very, very moving conversation. So if you have a chance, go back there and, and watch. Uh, Season 3, Episode 7. Mary tells Matthew of a time in her life when things were so bad that she was going to end her life. And she was standing on the precipice of a cliff, and she was going to jump off the cliff and die. And all of a sudden, this dove came flying up in front of her face. And she couldn't take her eyes off it. So she started following the dove. And the dove led her to Jesus. And then Jesus saved her, literally from death and from her past. And he released the demon and made her whole again. And she became one of the most fervent followers of Christ and bringing other people with her faith. 
So God pursues us even when we can't see our worth in the world. That's when God sends someone or something to us to guide us back to him. Guide us back to him. How many people are saying to themselves, I can't be saved because I did too many bad things. God will reject me. So what we need to do, God will not reject you. If you come to him with an earnest heart by prayer and petition, as it says in the scriptures, he will answer those prayers. He will answer those prayers. If you truly want to be released from what you have gone through in your past, from the things you've done in your past, you come to God with an earnest heart in prayer and petition. And say, please, God, remove me from this. Come into my heart. I make you my Lord and Savior today. That's all it takes to be born again. <clears throat> Is it that acceptance, that trust, that belief, that faith in Christ, that he will do what the word says he will do. And he will relieve you from that past. But many people need to have that reset in their thinking when they feel discouraged about poor choices in their past. You need to understand what grace is all about. See, it's that grace that is forgiveness that is given freely, not doled out on the basis of your worthiness. God doesn't say, well, you know, Vicki, I'm not sure you're worthy to receive my grace. So you're going to be stuck in your past and you have to deal with all that stuff. But see, that's not what God, I can say that because she's my sister. <laughs> they probably won't come they're visiting from Illinois we had our Thanksgiving last night she said I'm not coming to church with you again but see that's not how it works grace says we have grace freely given to us we have forgiveness freely given to us when we call upon the name of Christ and how do we call upon the name of Christ God I want to be released from this I put my faith and my trust and my belief in you Release me from what I've had in my past. And if we do that, his word says he will answer that prayer and you will be forgiven. Amen? Amen. Amen. And a lot of times God is stepping into our lives at times when we need it the most. And instead of getting what you deserve for what you've done, he gives us grace and mercy. Undeserved gifts, unearned gifts of salvation. You just need to have faith and believe just need to have faith and believe. See, that becomes that loyalty and that trust in God. Wow, I'm going long today. Sorry. <laughs> I get carried away at times. So in parting today, I'm going to leave you with some questions to ponder. Answer them out loud if you will, if you want to. What are the times that you can think of when God stepped into your life and changed your direction for the better? That's number one. Number two, are you open to God's influence in your life today, right now? Are you open? Is your heart open to accept that grace, that mercy, that forgiveness, that salvation, that love? Is your heart open to that today? And if it is, say yes to God. Okay? Does anything in your life need to change in order for you to get to where God wants you to be? Not where you want to be. Remember, God has a plan for your life. He can't get you there if you're standing in his way all the time. you got to say, yes, take me there. Show me the plan. And until you accept that in faith, in trust, in belief, you'll never get there. Time is getting short. Out of 13, 10 prophecies have already come to be. There's only three left. If not today, then when? So here's the biggie. Who could you share a story about your faith journey and that it might cause them to want to know more about Jesus' kingdom, how to get there, and why? Think about that today. Are you ready to face Jesus today? Thank you, all. Let us pray. Gracious Lord and Heavenly Father, we praise you and thank you for this opportunity to gather here together today. We thank you for your word. We thank you for your message. And we look forward, to Lord, to you working in our lives. 
Lord, let us have that faith today, that belief, to turn our lives to you, gracious Lord, to bring us back home to that right relationship that you have waiting for us, that the future that you have waiting for us. Lord, change our perceptions. Change those things that we need in our lives to bring us into that right relationship with you and help us start on that path today. Lord, we come before you today. We confess that we are sinners and we are in need of your grace and mercy. Lord, we repent of our sins today and we pray for forgiveness. We pray that by the power and the love and the blood of Jesus that we can be redeemed and made whole again in you and through you. Lord Jesus, we ask for you to come into our hearts and we make you our Lord and Savior today. We thank you for that blessed assurance that we will be with you in heaven and that your spirit will give us that strength, the hope and the love to be your disciples in this lost world so that we can bring those other lost people home to you today. Lord, we lift up our lives, our church, our city, our state and our nation to you. Lord, we live in a broken world. There are so many people that need your word, that need your promises, that need your assurances today in this world. Lord, we would live in a completely different world if we would simply reach out to those who are lost. Lord, we thank you that you have love enough to circle this entire world. And we ask that you would do a, a mighty act in, of healing in us and in the world. That your word and your name would be boldly proclaimed and that your works would be done. Embolden us today to step up and step out, to bring home the lost, lead us to growth in your spirit, and keep us unto you. And in your precious name today we pray. Amen? Amen. Amen. So, wow. As we come into this time of, of communion today, if you haven't uh, grabbed one of the communion cups over there, um, they're on the back table. They're kind of fun. They're a new, new style communion cup that uh, I ordered. And uh, didn't realize us in time, but uh, take the bottom off first. <laughs> and release the bread before you undo the juice and dump it on you. Yes, I did it the first time. I was going, oh, is this one going to work? I had the top up, and I, I had it all over my shirt. Mm -hmm. Yes, he did. So... <laughs> He does a great job at the laundry. You never see him. <laughs> but as we come into this time of uh, communion today, it's a time for us to celebrate the gifts and the love that God has given to us. It is a time for us to understand the meaning of Jesus going to the cross, that he nailed our sins to the cross. He nailed our inequities to the cross. The things that would separate us from God he nailed to the cross. He died to those things. The blood he shed washed us clean from the past, from those inequities, from those sins. His body was broken down for us so that our body doesn't have to be broken. And he did that out of love, out of grace, and out of mercy. So on the evening that he was given up, as he was having a Seder meal with the disciples. He took bread and he broke it and he said, this is my body which is broken for you. Take and eat. <coughs> Likewise, in the meal later on, he took the cup and he filled it and he blessed it. And he said, this is the cup of the new covenant, my blood shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Can you hear the nails in the cross? His body broken for us, his blood shed for us, that we would be made clean through grace, mercy, forgiveness, to receive salvation and to receive that place in his home in heaven. The body of Christ broken for you. The blood of Christ shed for you. Thanks be to God. Well, good morning.
morning, everyone. It's so nice to see all of you here this morning. You have no idea what it means to me to have my family and friends and everybody here. It's so exciting. And so now it's time for prayers for the people. And first of all, I want to acknowledge Monica's birthday was this week. So happy birthday, Monica. I hope God blesses you immensely this week. Thank you. And praise God for you. Is there anyone that would like prayer this morning that I can offer up to God for you? Okay. Well, we'll get started. Father God, we come to you this morning to honor and praise your holy name. As it says in Psalms 139, 1 through 4, O Lord, you have searched me, and you know me. You know when I sit and when I rise. You perceive my thoughts from afar. You discern my going out and my lying down. You are familiar with all my ways. Before a word is on my tongue, you know it completely, O Lord. O hear this prayer, O Lord. Let the Holy Spirit rest upon all who are listening. Father God, we lift up Chloe and Becky. We thank you for the quick healing of her lungs this week, Lord. We praise you for this precious child, and we ask for guidance in the days ahead to keep her healthy. Calm Becky's mind and heart as she cares for Chloe. Give her wisdom in each passing day. Father God, we lift up Joe and thank you for his life, and we ask for quick and complete restoration for both knees, from both knee surgeries. We praise you for the doctors who can do these surgeries to provide comfort for all who are in need. We also lift up Mark and we praise you for his life and ask for healing for his knee. We ask that there will be an opening to do surgery before the end of this year to alleviate his pain. Father God, all things are possible with you. We trust you for the answer to this prayer. Father God, we ask for safe travels for Terry and Diane. Please take them to and from safely wherever they go this week. We also ask for safe travels for all who are traveling this week for the Thanksgiving holiday. Please protect my grandson Dylan as he flies in from Texas tomorrow. Give the pilot wisdom, courage, and knowledge to bring him and all the passengers here safely. Keep my grandson Colt safe as he travels home as well. We thank you, Jesus, for opening up the shelters for the homeless. May they all find rest and be at peace with one another. Father God, we lift up our children and grandchildren and all their friends and families. We thank you and praise you for each and every one of them. Please walk with them daily, guide them, help them to act justly and to love mercy and to walk humbly with you, O oh God. And that's from Micah 6, 8. May they bless you and honor you with their actions, words, and deeds. We pray for constant care over Amanda and Kelly. You know their needs. Please meet them right where they are, and we ask for mercy and healing for both of them. Father God, you are thinking, you are the king of the universe overall. As Israel and Hamas are at war, you are in control. Help, is, help us not to lose hope or be fearful of the days ahead, for you are God, and, through, and there is no other. We trust in you for all these things, Lord Jesus. And we thank you, Jesus, that each one of us are beautifully and wonderfully made, all with different personalities, different talents, different hopes, different dreams in this life. But we can all receive the gift of hope and salvation if we humbly bow before you. If you choose to do this today, repeat loudly or silently after me. Father God, I humbly come to you today asking for forgiveness of my sins. Wash me, cleanse me with the blood of Jesus. Come into my life and I may have that personal relationship with you and everlasting salvation that only you can give. I receive you into my life today. I want to praise you and worship you in all areas of my life. Thank you for dying on the cross for me, for the shedding of your blood that I might have eternal life. You are a great and mighty God who has power and authority over all the kingdoms of this earth. Yet you take time to know each and every one of us that you created. Not one of us is a mistake. You call us each by name. You know our inmost being. You love us for who we are. And we praise you today for all the things. Be glory to God in the highest. In Jesus' name. <coughs> you said my prayer. Oh, I did? Didn't I? <laughs> See, that's
that's one of those things I was talking about. Yeah. We don't talk about this no, ahead of no, time. You no. had no idea what I was doing no, for my message <laughs> today, but you know, there it is in your prayer. Yeah. Um, and that's why when I talk about these God incidents, things that happen, um, and, we're, and we have our ears open to hear, our eyes open to see. Did you notice how her prayer matched up perfectly with the message today? God has someone here he's trying to talk to. God has someone here, whether you're online or here in person, God's trying to talk to you today. So that's why he does these things. If you think it's just simply a coincidence, how many times has this happened? I know. All the time. Mm -hmm. And we don't talk about it. She has no idea what I'm preparing for the message ahead of time. But you do an awesome job with the prayers. Thank you. God does. God does. Yes. It's wonderful when he speaks loud and clear to us like this. This brings us to the end of our online portion of our service today. Hopefully you guys have been blessed with the message that you've heard today. We have message and music coming up next in here. Uh, Doug is posting up the playlist online. All you have to do is click on it. It'll take you to a whole list of videos on there. And uh, so you can just go ahead and play those through and get that blessing as well today. Uh, so we just uh, thank everyone for being here today. We ask that you would have a safe and wonderful holiday time this week and uh, enjoy the music and the message today. Father God, may we strive to be reconciled to you this week and to one another. Help us to always remember and live by the words that Jesus shared with his disciples as he taught them to pray. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who have sinned against us. Amen? Amen. 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 Go in peace.